The first item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Move there approval. a motion to approve. Wolf moves. Second. Lindstrom seconds. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carried. Uh, approval of the August 5th minutes of our regular community development committee meeting. So moved. Uh, Linnea moves. Second. And um, um, Johnson seconds. Um, motion and a second. Is there any discussion regarding the minutes? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carried. Our first item of business is 2019-230 JT, City of Ridgefield. Michael Larson. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of uh, members of the Community Development Committee. I'm Michael Larson, Senior Planner and Local Planning Assistance. Uh, before today, we have the um, City of Richfield's 2040 Comprehensive Plan. I'd like to recognize um, representatives from Richfield that are here today. Uh, we have John Stark, who's the Community Development Director, uh, as well as uh, Julie Urban, the Housing Manager in the City of Richfield. And Lance Bernard, their consultant with HKGI, is, is here as well. Uh, this map shows location of regional system components within the city of Richfield. All wastewater generated within the city is conveyed through five council interceptors. All flow is treated at the council's metropolitan wastewater treatment plant in St. Paul. Uh, regional highway system elements include 35W and 494, as well as Minnesota Trunk Highway 62 and 77. Regional transit system elements include the Metro Orange Line along 35W with a planned station at 66th Street uh, and the planned arterial bus rapid transit uh, D line along Portland Avenue. Uh, existing and planned regional parks and trails elements include Nine Mile Creek and the Nokomis Minnesota River Regional Trails and the search corridor for the Progressive Rail Regional Trail down the, down you see down the middle of your map. As shown in figure two of your staff report shown here, uh, Thrive MSP 2040 designates the city as urban center. Uh, Richfield is located in the southeastern portion of Hennepin County, surrounded by the city of Minneapolis, uh, the unincorporated area of Fort Snelling, uh, and the cities of Bloomington and Edina. Table one, is, as shown in your staff report, shows that between 2020 and 2040, the council forecasts that the city will grow by approximately 800 households and 1,250 population. Uh, you will see that the uh, current employment estimate for Richfield has already exceeded the council's official forecast for 2030. This is due to the larger than anticipated employment growth uh, since the release of the system statement. As the council does not unilaterally change employment forecasts and the city has declined uh, uh, to request a forecast change, uh, the official forecasts do remain the same. Uh, additional employment growth in urban center, center communities uh, is consistent with council policies. Uh, and in this particular case does not represent uh, an issue related to system capacity. Table two from the staff report shown here uh, illustrates the planned residential density for the city which includes acreage the city has identified for potential development and its guiding land use. Policy for the most intense uses of land are, are largely associated with the hub at 66th and Lindale uh, and the Cedar Avenue Richfield Parkway corridor. The minimum plan density for uh, expectation for urban center communities is 20 units per acre and Richfield is consistent that with a minimum plan density of just over 25 units per acre. So the city's existing land use pattern shows some uh, significant features that I'd like to highlight in my presentation. Uh, these include the mixed use district at the, at the hub that I had mentioned earlier, centered on 66th Street and Lindale Avenue and extending eastward to Nicollet Avenue. Uh, this is proximate to the city's Wood Lake Nature Center uh, to the southwest. Uh, just make a pitch for visiting this park. Uh, I did a couple summers ago, and although it is not a regional park, uh, you can see it's quite sad, uh, sizable uh, and is an important part of the landscape in the community. So in this image here shows, just show, give you a little appreciation for this area if, you've not, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, it kind of emphasizes, I think, the importance of the relationship between 
local planning, redevelopment planning, open space, and regional transportation infrastructure. As you can see, this area will be served by the future Orange Line station at 66th Street. Uh, the city is also uh, home to uh, Best Buy's World Headquarters near the future Orange Line station uh, at the interchange near the interchange of Interstate 35W and 494. Uh, and the city is transforming on its eastern edge, including a new com new commercial and residential uses along the first phase uh, of the planned Richfield Parkway that will extend to the south. This sh slide shows the city's planned land use map, which is also in figure four of your staff report. The plan principally supports further development of mixed use areas and districts in three main parts of the city, uh, the Penn Avenue uh, corridor, the hub or 66 in Lindale, the Cedar Avenue corridor, uh, uh, which includes redevelopment more suitable for its proximi proximity to the airport and supported by the planned southward extension of Richfield Parkway to 77th Street. Uh, the other central feature uh, to Richfield's planned land use is the mix of larger scale commercial residential and mixed uses along the, uh, the north of uh, 494 frontage. So uh, as detailed in your staff report, uh, staff find uh, proposed findings for you that the plan conforms to metropolitan system plans, is consistent with council policies, and is compatible with the plans of adjacent local governmental units and affected jurisdictions. This plan, uh, the uh, Tuesday, uh, August 27th, environmental services staff will present, well, actually this will probably be on the consent, but this will be presented to the Environment Committee on August 27th with full council uh, um, approval on September 25th. And I just want to remind you that John Clark and Julie Urban from the city are here and if you have any questions uh, directly for the city. Uh, so the proposed action for you today is to authorize the city of Richfield to place its 2040 comp plan into effect and advise the city to uh, implement the advisory comments in the review record for surface water management and water supply. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll take any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Larson. And uh, my apologies to the committee members for being late. My thanks to Council Member Vento for filling in then. Uh, any questions on that report? Any questions? Seeing none, Mr. Larson has proposed an action that we authorize the city of Richfield to place the 2040 comprehensive plan into effect and advise the city to implement the advisory comments in the review record for surface water management and water supply. Is there a motion? Is there a second? Councilmember Bento moves it. Second. Great. Any discussion on that motion? Councilmember Bento. Um, since um, Councilmember Cummings isn't here tonight, I'll take her place. And Thank you. Um, I just want to uh -huh. compliment the city of Richfield. Um, I'm a little bit familiar with the city, and I, I consider um, your council member Mary Supple a dear friend. So, um, kudos to the to the city of, of Richfield. Thank you. Any further discussion? Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I I would be remiss because I'm filling big shoes. Um, that Katie Rodriguez left, and now she's at the city of Richfield. So I know the good work she's done before me for my district, and I'm really, again, very pleased for the city and for the whole team over there um, and wishing all of you very well. Thank you, and I want to thank our friends from Richfield for being here today as well. Further discussion? Councilmember Atlas Ingerbritson. Thank you. I'd just like to thank you for pointing out and providing that photo of the great illustration um, between nature reserving and preserving great natural space um, with density, the new density in that area. My grandmother, um, grandparents, and most of my aunts and uncles lived in Richfield mm -hmm. for the last, for a very long time um, until she, anyways, moved elsewhere. But um, so it's an area that I got to benefit a lot from because she didn't drive like many people of her age and so we could walk to a great park um, to Bridgman's where I got to see teens eat something I never would have the opportunity to try which is like this giant sundae and a giant bowl <laughs> um, and then finish some shopping at the hub and walk back to her apartment that was affordable so I just think it's a great community and that was a wonderful illustration of what we need to strive for in all of our our community so thanks for calling that out and I'm really glad that Richfield's been able to maintain and build on that great quality so thank you thank you council member further discussion on the motion further discussion 
Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you, Mr. Larson. And we're on to 2019-231, JT, the City of Minneapolis 2040 Comprehensive Plan and Comprehensive Sewer Plan. Mr. Larson. It's me again. Yes. <laughs> Michael oh. Larson, Local Planning Assistant. Uh, so now before you is the review of the City of Minneapolis's Comprehensive Plan. I want to acknowledge a couple of people in the audience uh, that have come today. Uh, one is uh, Paul Mogish, the uh, uh, manager of long range planning in the community planning and economic development um, department of the city. Um, and I, there's Joe Bernard as well, who's, uh, uh, let me see, I have your title here, planning project manager at the city of Minneapolis, and as well as Lauren Olson um, from Intergovernmental Relations. Um, Thank you for being here. Yes, all three of them. Thank you for coming. I'd like to express uh, an appreciation for all the hard work uh, that they have done and their colleagues have done in the plan, as well as uh, appreciation for their patience as we've worked through a review of the plan and dealt with various issues of uh, completeness in getting to this point. So appreciate that. So this first map shows you the regional system components uh, within the city of Minneapolis. And given the size and centrality of Minneapolis, I'm not going to list them all. <laughs> uh, I will only briefly summarize them, uh, but a couple of interesting uh, highlights. Wastewater is conveyed through 27 council interceptors that extend throughout the city and also provide service to communities upstream from Minneapolis. Uh, transit system elements, of course, include the Metro Blue and Green Line uh, light rail transit stations and their planned extensions, uh, as well as Metro Orange Line bus rapid transit along 35W and existing and planned arterial uh, bus rapid transit routes. Uh, regional park system elements include numerous regional parks, park reserves, and special recreational features, including those along and including um, the city's chain of lakes uh, and uh, Mississippi River. So as shown in uh, figure two of your staff report, Thrive MSP 2040 uh, designates the city as urban center. That's a designation uh, <laughs> shared by five communities that border. Uh, six additional cities uh, that border um, have the designation of urban. So table one in your staff report illustrates a proposed forecast revision for the city concurrent with the approval of this comp plan. Uh, current official forecasts are shown along with a proposed set of a revised forecasts that are uh, by the, proposed by the city and supported by council staff. Table one shows that between 2018 and 2040, the council forecasts that the city will grow uh, by just under 30,000 households. Uh, the forecast population for Minneapolis in 2040 is now 485,000, an increase uh, from 2018 of over 56,000 people. Uh, I think you uh, may find it interesting to know that Minneapolis, I believe I'm correct in this, uh, that Minneapolis uh, peaked in population around the 1950 census when the census recorded the population at 522,000. So Minneapolis also has an employment forecast re revision as part of this approval. Uh, and you will see that in Minneapolis employment estimates are nearing their previous forecasts for 2030, uh, necessitating a revision that the city has supported. The revised forecast for 2040 anticipates approximately 28,000 additional jobs from, from current estimates. <coughs> Table uh, two from the staff report, uh, which is shown uh, in summary here, illustrates the planned residential densities for the city. Uh, again, which include the acreages identified for potential or likely redevelopment and its guiding land use. Policies, again, for the most intense land, uh, land uses, likely areas for redevelopment and allocation of the city's uh, growth uh, are largely associated with uh, several different areas, including downtown Minneapolis and its constituent neighborhoods, uh, the Midtown Corridor, and stations along the Metro Blue and Green Lines. Each of the categories that are shown here have a set of built form categories associated with them, which are articulated in the staff report. Um, so what you're seeing here is a summary uh, of those categories. For example, uh, the public office and institutional category here uh, includes both neighborhood and downtown scale uses of that type uh, within this land use category so that the uh, density range is um, uh, articulated amongst that very large range that you see there. Uh, 
Uh, the minimum plan density expectation for urban center communities is 20 units an acre. Uh, Minneapolis is consistent with this policy with the potential overall density range of 98.2 to 622.7. Now, Minneapolis plan is notable for its support for increased density, uh, which reflects a lot of recent market demand uh, for small, uh, small apartments uh, in high amenity and high amenity rich areas of the city. Um, this does not necessarily mean that these highest densities will necessarily be the norm. Nevertheless, this policy framework supports the recommended forecast increase uh, as well as provides support for the regional transit system. So Minneapolis probably doesn't need a lot of explanation, but I'm going to just uh, emphasize a few things about its existing land use. Um, obviously, as the city's most central and largest uh, city in the region, it reflects the landing. The land use pattern reflects decades of development and redevelopment, as well as the adaptation and evolution over time, uh, including the impacts of regional growth, uh, changing transportation technology uh, and public investments, and the lasting impacts of things such as institutionalized economic and racial discrimination. So Minneapolis includes many of the region's most important cultural and recreational institutions, corporate headquarters, and financial institutions. It also includes a significant concentration of poverty uh, where people of color make up a majority of the population. Although it's not in the council's purview to re review these details in great, uh, to a great extent, the plan does address these issues on many levels from land use to transportation to economic development. As I mentioned earlier, the Minneapolis plan includes both a guiding future land use map as well as a built form designation that together constitute land use policy for the city. This map shows planned land uses. On this map, the major business and institutional centers of downtown Minneapolis and the University of Minnesota are guided as public office and institutional. Another distinctive guiding land use feature in the city is production and processing, the guiding land use, um, for example, for the mid-city industrial area and other areas of the city where the policy intent is to preserve these in, uh, areas for industry and for employment-related uses. Outside of these areas, the predominant map color that you see is the yellow, which reflects the designation uh, of, ur of urban neighborhood. Major commercial quarters and smaller scale commercial nodes are shown throughout the city uh, with designations that include mixed corridor mixed use, neighborhood mixed use. For places like Uptown and the Central and Lowry uh, areas, the designation is called destination mixed use. Now this map shows the companion built form designations, which relates to the bulk height and orientation of buildings and it impacts the intensity of both residential and employment uses. The designations include uh, a number that is associated with increasing intensity. Um, there are three designations called interior that re largely relate to the different uh, scale and history of, of urban neighborhoods through the bulk of the city. There are three types of corridor designation, corridor three, four, and five, shown there as an example along Penn Avenue. Um, and there are four types of transit-related uh, designations, transit 10, 15, 20, and 30. And there's an example showing where you can find those designations along the Hiawatha corridor. And the most intense um, built form designation is called Core 50. And you can imagine uh, where that is. Uh, and it's uh, located at downtown Minneapolis. So as with other cities of the region, Minneapolis's plan identifies areas that are likely candidates for de development or redevelopment, which are shown here overlaying that previous built form map. So I can, uh, it might be a little bit hard to read, it's the largest city, um, but it shows the areas where the city anticipates uh, a development is possible or likely. Uh, and as you can see, again, these areas reflect growth primarily in, in and around downtown Minneapolis. Uh, in a long transit corridor, at least the key uh, key development uh, locations. So your staff report includes additional technical analysis, uh, summary of technical analysis that went into the review of the plan uh, regarding conformance with regional systems as well as consistency with regional policy uh, and are the basis for the proposed findings for you today. And those are that the Minneapolis 2040 plan conforms to regional uh, metropolitan system plan is consistent with council policies and is compatible 
with the plans of adjacent local governmental units and affected jurisdictions. Next step for this, uh, this plan, uh, this will be presented uh, at the Environment Committee on Tuesday, August 27th. Uh, this will not be on the consent agenda and uh, colleague Kyle Colvin will present this at the Envir Environment Committee and then will be seen, uh, heard by the full council on Wednesday, September 25th. And I just wanna remind you as we're getting uh, close to the end of my presentation that uh, we have several, uh, we have a few representatives from the uh, city in the audience today. <clears throat> so the proposed action uh, for you today is to authorize the city of Minneapolis to place the 2040 comprehensive plan into effect. To revise the city's forecast upward is shown in table one of the review record. Advise the city to adopt the uh, Merca plan uh, within 60 days after receiving the final DNR approval and submit a copy of the final adopted plan and evidence of adoption to the DNR Council and National Park Service within 10 days after the adoption. Uh, to implement the advisory comments in the re review record for transportation, surface water management, and water supply. And upon its completion, to submit the updated transportation action plan as an amendment to the 2040 comp plan uh, for council review. Uh, Mr. Chair, that uh, concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Larson, for your work on this and, and for the presentation. I want to thank the city staff that's here, Ms. Olson, Mr. Mogish, Mr. Bernard, for spending time with me and really sharing your methodology and your community engagement uh, strategies. And I just want to congratulate you on a really amazing piece of work. And I was really impressed with the way that you used data uh, and sort of layered it to come up with a, a really an innovative 2040 plan and I really appreciated how uh, your planning, your long range planning director and you uh, all use history and especially some of the history of the restrictive covenants and other practices that created the segregation that persists in Minneapolis and by deliberately trying to understand history to, to do better going forward. So congratulations on the work. Any discussion on this plan, on this report? Uh, Councilmember Lindstrom. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd love to hear more about that, how they use data to inform this plan as a result to the history that you just outlined. I would invite one of the CPED staff up if you wanted to just respond to the council member's question. Unless, Mr. Larson, you wanted to. So. I think well, you want. Suitable. <laughs> okay, Mr. Mogush, welcome. Thanks uh, for being here. Good afternoon, community members. My name is Paul Mogush. I'm the matter of, manager of community planning at the city of Minneapolis. Uh, so the answer to the question about how we use data for this comprehensive plan could take us well in the <laughs> evening. Uh, so I'll I'll try to just. We have a public it. hearing at six o'clock. Yeah, you, ha you have important. Um, <laughs> I don't want to hold up the other communities who are waiting for their comp plans to be approved, but. Um, uh, I'll just I'll summarize really briefly, uh, specifically on, on the issues of our, our history in Minneapolis and around the country of um, uh, racially restrictive housing policies. That, that is a, a subject that we, we chose to focus on quite a bit during the public engagement process for Minneapolis 2040 uh, for a number of reasons. Um, but the, the most important reason is that we heard uh, very early on from the community that uh, issues of racial equity were top of mind for our community. That was true of our city leadership as well, and for us as planners. And um, we, we decided to, to dive into this process and, and try to make um, this comprehensive plan, which meets statutory requirements and which meets administrative requirements of the Metropolitan Council, do more than that and to aspire to contribute to a future that does not have racial disparities in, in Minneapolis. So in order to start that conversation, we presented a lot of data and, and a lot of history uh, to our community members and had that conversation. Thank you, Mr. Mogush. And uh, folks probably know there was a robust uh, community engagement process. There was quite a bit of organizing going on to help influence uh, and participate in the comp planning process. And uh, again, I commend city staff for really stepping up, providing this data so that the debate was fact-based and, uh, and surviving it. It was quite a long process, so thanks. Further discussion on this re uh, report? Yeah, Council Member Alice Singer Britson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd also just like to really commend um, the city of Minneapolis around just recognizing um, the value of doing engagement on the front end to really inform the practice and being able to let people clearly know how 
information that was received during that engagement was used to adjust and develop the plan. I think it's just a critical practice that in the public sector we have to do as much as possible and to and, and definitely in the recognition that there were plans in place that got us into the situation that we're at today. And it's gonna take planning intentionally and explicitly to get us out of that place. So um, I really appreciate that effort and know that it's a lot of work up front, but really believe that when you do that work up front on the back end, you're dealing with a much more resilient and meaningful and impactful um, project and outcome. So thank you for that work. Thank you, Council Member. Further discussion? Councilman Blessing, do you want to move this? Sure, in? thank you. Happy to move this. Thanks. In. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Discussion on the motion? Discussion. Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Congratulations and thank you. We'll move on to the third business item, which is 2019-232. It's the Dakota County Rural Collaborative, DCRC, 2040 Comprehensive Plan. Mr. Borland is here to present. Thank you, Chair Lagrin. Um, okay, uh, my name is Patrick Boylan. I work in local planning assistance. Um, I grew up for St. Paul and Dakota County. Um, for us today is Dakota County Rural Collaborative. I'm going to be real deliberate about the names of all the communities a couple of times. Thank you. It's important <laughs> to get it all right. Yeah. So um, the DCRC um, is Castle Rock, Douglas, uh, Greenvale, Hampton, uh, Marchand, Ninager, Randolph, Ravenna, Vermillion, and Waterford Township. Great. So this is Dakota County. The uh, blank areas um, are the incorporated cities and or um, two uh, townships that are not participating in the collaborative. Um, Dakota County is home to many natural resources, um, including um, several regional parks. Uh, Measle Ravine is a um, uh, kind of a ge geologic wonder. Um, but again, Dakota County is also known for protecting farmland, so that lower left uh, image is kind of cru crucial to that. And then um, also um, lots of farming, of course, for um, the reflection of the soils that exist there. So again, Ninager Township is sort of the northernmost um, uh, uh, community. Um, and then off to the uh, east is Ravenna Township, Marchand, Douglas, and then Hampton, Randolph to the south, uh, Waterford, moving further west to Greenvale, Castle Rock, and then Vermilion Townships. Um, what you see on this map for regional systems um, includes um, regional parks, uh, um, Easel Review, I mentioned, also um, the um, uh, several of the uh, regional trail search corridors, including the Vermilion River Greenway, uh, which connects parts other parts of Dakota County uh, with the Mississippi River. Um, there are um, in, er, there's no interstates through this part of the region, but there's uh, US 52 and US Highway 61 that connect uh, the Twin Cities to um, Rochester and points beyond. Between designations, four um, is mixed. Um, the majority of these communities are agricultural. Uh, Ravenna Township is a diversified rural, and then um, Randolph Township is both diversified rural and agriculture in nature. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, this is the population household employment that we put forth in all of our staff uh, reports and we talked about. I summarize it as follows. The population change between 2020 and 2040 um, is 510 folks um, representing 540 households and employment change of between 2020 and 2040 of 420 jobs. So um, a very large geographic area, very small population household and employment change, but uh, very important agricultural jobs nonetheless. Existing land use, um, the uh, lighter or blank areas um, uh, shown on the map um, are agriculture or undeveloped. Um, I've spent a lot of time, I've been at the council for 13 years, and I've spent a lot of time at Dakota County. Um, there's not a lot of vacant land there. It's, it's high intensity agricultural uses there. Um, if it isn't uh, open water or wetland or um, regional park trail. Um, so you see um, scattered light yellow and darker yellow, which is the residential components. Uh, there's um, limited commercial and industrial uses. The future land use, no surprise, looks nearly identical. I assure you it's not identical, but it looks that way on this scale. Um, this represents, um, you know, a um, couple hundred square miles, and it's uh, uh, there are some changes to the residential component, which reflected in the um, analysis for residential growth and population growth. 
Um, the proposed findings is that the plan conforms to metropolitan system plans. It's consistent with regional policies and it's compatible with the plans of adjacent local government units and affected jurisdictions. Um, this will not go to the Environment Committee because there's no tour <coughs> plan for this. Um, these are all um, septic system um, communities. So we'll go later this or later in uh, September um, to the full council. And so the proposed action before you today in the staff report is to authorize the following townships of Dakota County Rural Collaborative to place through 2040 competent plans in effect. Um, again, for the record, I want to read them all one by one. Castle Rock Township, Douglas Township, Greenville Township, Greenville Township, Hampton Township, Marchand Township, Ninager Township, Randolph Township, Rivetta Township, Vermillion Township, and Waterford Township. Rose Action also includes advised Ninager and Ravenna Townships. Those are the two along the Mississippi River to adopt their um, Mississippi River Critical Corridor Area plans within 60 days after receiving the final DNR uh, approval and submit a copy of the final plan and evidence of this adoption to the DNR, the Council, the National Park Service within 10 days of adoption. Also to advise the Rural Collaborative to implement the advisory comments and the review record for transportation, service water management, forecasts, and water supply. Um, uh, there is a representative of the townships here um, with Bolton Mink, Jane Cancier. Um, I'm available for any questions you might have at this time. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Thanks for, to our guests for being here. Discussion on that report? Councilmember Lindstrom. Thank you. I have to admit I wasn't aware that townships could come together to form a collaborative <laughs> like this, uh, which is a good thing, right? Uh, so each one doesn't have to <clears throat> recreate the wheel, especially when they're geographically close together. Are there other collaboratives like this around the metropolitan area? Mr. Boy Mr. Boylan or Ms. Yeah. Barajas? Mr. Chair, Councilmember Lindstrom, well, certainly there are a lot of communities that share services, whether it's police, fire, engineering services, or even planning <coughs> services. This is the only collaborative um, that we have in this format. Um, counties um, like Scott County and uh, Carver County actually perform the planning function for the townships within their um, jurisdictions. Uh, in Dakota County, that is not the case. The townships do the planning on their own. Very good, thanks. Thank you. Further discussion? Councilmember Wolf, would you like to move this item? I would. This is a large portion of my district. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is there a second? And Councilmember Atlas, you have seconds. Any discussion? Councilmember Wolf, I thought for sure you were going to tell Can us I, all the best restaurants yeah, ever. <laughs> <Sort of. laughs> or, the, or the vegetable stands, or. Well, actually. Don't put her on the spot. Yeah. No, actually, <laughs> Miesville, Miesville Ravine. Regional That's Park what I wanted is to know. amazing. It's not at all developed. Um, it's basically you drive down a gravel road, the road dips down, there's little gravel parking lots on the sides, and that's the park. You can walk on unpaved trails, there's a vault toilet, and that, that's pretty much it for the park. It's, it's a, a well kept secret, not intentionally, it just you know, with nothing there, it's hard to, to advertise, but there are a lot of deer and you will see the DNR officers there all the time because of all of the poaching that happens mm. in the park because of all of the deer. <laughs> mm. But it, it, I mean, in terms of environment, it's amazing. And uh, uh, I actually got stopped by the DNR because my kayak didn't have a up-to-date registration sticker oh. on it, which I have remedied. But uh, <laughs> uh, Patrick didn't mention Lake Billsby Park either, and that is one that is has a little bit of development, but there's a large portion of it that has nothing in it yet, so there is no public access. There's road through land that's publicly owned and preserved for the future, but there's nothing there to give people access. So that's one of the things that Dakota County is working on for the future. There's a lot of land and not a lot of money to develop all of that land, even though Dakota County has been putting significant local dollars into developing its parks and managing invasive species within the natural areas as well. So as far as restaurants and stuff, this is not the developed. Part, okay. So I don't have any restaurant recommendations. Thank you. For you. Thank you. 
Great. Uh, we have a motion before us. Uh, that Mr. Brennan has proposed to authorize the 10 townships of the Dakota Rural Collaborative to place their 2040 comprehensive plans into effect and also guidance from my council staff. Uh, seeing no further discussion, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you. We'll move on to the fourth business item, which is 2019-233 JT, the City of Lakeville 2040 Comprehensive Plan and Comprehensive Sewer Plan. Mr. Mullen, you're up again. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair Lugren. Uh, just to note that uh, Chris Jensen, the City Planner, and Daryl Moray, the Planning Director, are here in attendance um, this afternoon. Great. Thanks for being here. Uh, City of Lakeville uh, is surrounded by Burnsville, Apple Valley, uh, Farmington, Eureka, New Market Township. Um, and the regional systems before you show um, several regional trail search corridors, um, regional parks, including a, just a tiny bit of Murphy Hanoran um, and Clear Lake, um, and Interstate uh, 35 um, uh, runs north-south, connecting um, points further south, and the Burnsville and, and northern, or communities to the north, including uh, Minneapolis. Um, the community designation for the city uh, is uh, uh, suburban edge, rather, and again, showing the communities surrounding it. Um, there's kind of a wide variety um, of communities in terms of the community designation, which reflects that Lakeville is sort of that part of it is, um, you know, established and even experiencing a redevelopment, but there's some of it that's very much on the uh, developing edge um, with uh, substantial agriculture still going on in the community. Um, the forecasts in front of you um, show a growing community um, with a population um, by 2040 of 80,500 uh, households representing 30,000 households um, and employment growing um, from 18 from a little over 17,000 uh, in 2018 to over 22,500 in the year 2040. Uh, planned residential density. Um, so for the city of Lakeville, I see a variety of land uses and uh, calculating out um, the minimum units we expect um, between 6,836 and 13,898 units, which represent an overall density of 4.13 to 8.40. Um, this community designation, we expect them to meet between three and five units per acre. So as a, as a as a community-wide um, density expectation, they meet that policy. Um, uh, the um, Cedar Avenue bus rapid transit um, along Cedar Avenue that's uh, with stationaries in the south um, in Lakeville, um, some are within the current PPP and others are within the, um, uh, bringing the phrase here, um, Uh, I'm forgetting the phrase. Increased revenue scenario. Increased revenue scenario. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Increased revenue scenario showing additional stops along that bus rapid transit. And so for this community designation, we expect a minimum of eight units per acre. Um, the residential land uses in those community uh, station areas um, exceed that as well. Um, City of Lakeville, the existing land use, again, like a lot of suburban areas, um, you see a lot of uh, residential land uses. Um, Along 35W, you see some industrial uses, um, and then along some of the county roads, including Cedar Avenue, um, you see commercial areas and nodes um, of uh, both industrial and commercial land uses. The future land use looks similar to what's there now, except for more development. Um, some of those larger block areas um, of yellow in sort of the center and uh, of the community, um, you know, existing agriculture land um, was showing the Cedar Avenue um, uh, station areas uh, showing more intense development um, along that for future transit service. Um, one thing to note about Lakeville is that there's a pretty active arts community there. Um, they have an annual arts festival. Um, I've been there a couple times. Um, highly recommend it. I think the third third week in September. Um, the findings in my staff report before you today is that the plan conforms with the Metropolitan System plans. It's consistent with council policies. It's compatible with the plans and adjacent local government units and affected jurisdictions. And that the meeting schedule, um, the staff report is correct. The PowerPoint should say, well, it'll be at the, that's correct. It should be at, it will be at the environment committee um, on Tuesday the 27th, but this should be correct to say the Metropolitan Council on Wednesday, September 25th. Your staff report is correct. The PowerPoint is an error. Um, the action before you today is to authorize the city of Lakeville to place its 2040 
Farms Plan in effect and it advises you <coughs> to implement the advisory comments and review record for service water management. Um, like I said before, there are two representatives of the community here and I'm available for any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Boylan, and thanks to our guests for being here tonight. Uh, questions on that report? Any questions? Councilmember Wolf, would you like to move this? I would love to move the approval of this. I've actually participated in uh, the comp plan process in the late 90s and then uh, again in the late aughts, <laughs> I guess you would call it. <laughs> so, and I, I've known Daryl Morey since I was on the planning commission in 1996. Okay. So he's been there for a long time and has, has had his hand in this process for for a while, excellent job as a planner. Um, and after I move it and somebody seconds it, then maybe I can tell you the cool stuff. Okay, please, is there a second? <laughs> second. All right, comes from Wolf. So Lakeville has a downtown that's been there for over a hundred years. People don't realize that you know Lakeville isn't someplace that just kind of sprouted up in the 80s or something. I mean, it's it's got a long, long history. Um, back in the 30s, there was nothing between Lakeville and the Minnesota River. So the Lakeville Fire Department, if there was a brush fire in what is now Burnsville, would hang on to a trailer and pull it to wherever the fire was and try to fight the fire with their fire department. The municipal liquor operation started the day after Prohibition ended and is still there. It's the most profitable liquor operation in the state for a municipal liquor and there's a lot of great restaurants. I'm not even going to try to list them all, but um, try downtown. There's a great couple breweries and some other burger places, and, and uh, there's some unique one-off restaurants, not chains, by my house. So come on down and visit. I'll give you a tour. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rowan. Thank you. Moving on to our fifth business item, it's 2019-234JT, the City of Minnetonka Beach 2040 Comprehensive Plan and Comprehensive Sewer Plan. Mr. Riley, welcome. Thank you, Chair Lilligren. Uh, good afternoon, members of the council. Uh, I'm Jake Riley, a secretary representative for District 3. Um, I'd like to let the committee know that Beth Elliott is representing the city of Minnetonka Beach today, and she's here in the audience if you have any Thank questions. Thank you for being here, Ms. Elliott. Um, <laughs> and thanks also to both Beth and Suzanne Griffin, who's the city's administrator, who worked, uh, who were really great to work with through this whole process. Thank you, Mr. Um, so before you today is the review of the city of Minnetonka Beach's 20, 2040 comprehensive plan. Um, Minnetonka Beach is located uh, on an island in Lake Minnetonka, um, and this map shows the location of regional system components within the city of Minnetonka Beach. Um, well, there is a uh, meter, but the most <laughs> striking uh, element of the regional system is the um, Dakota Rail Regional Trail that sort of bisects the city um, coming across the um, bridge there from Orono. Uh, the community designation for the city of Minnetonka Beach is uh, suburban, um, and it is located, as I said, on the largest island in Lake Minnetonka in central Hennepin County, and it's surrounded by the communities of uh, Orono and Tonka Bay. Um, there's a lot of water, and Orono just sort of goes right around um, the city sort of in a hug. Um, <laughs> but I don't know. Uh, the forecasted growth for the city, uh, Table 1, also in your staff report, where it shows that between uh, 2020 and 2040, the council forecasts the city's population will um, actually decline by 10, uh, while the number of households will increase by 10. Uh, there will be no change of jobs in the city in the same time frame, and the city doesn't have any job centers or contacts. Um, so the city of Minnetonka Beach um, plan residential densities, uh, and I have here table two from the staff report, which illustrates um, those which are expected to be between 0.93 and 0.97 units per acre. Um, and now that you've sat through many of these presentations, um, you probably know that the plan is inconsistent with land use and residential density policies for the suburban community designation, which is five units per acre. Um, Thrive does call for an average uh, 
density is of five units per acre, um, but the plan itself identifies the city as a fully built out community with an existing development pattern that limits opportunities for higher density redevelopment or new development that could meet the city's suburban community designation minimum residential density requirements of five units per acre. Uh, there are seven vacant lots of record identified in the plan um, that are anticipated to be um, developed over the next uh, 20 plus years. Um, at the same residential densities existing in the city at this time. So that while they'll continue to strive for increased density through um, accessory dwelling units, lot splits when appropriate, um, there are uh, 5.37 acres um, sort of of that vacant land at this time. Um, given previous development patterns, the lack of planned residential development or redevelopment um, opportunities within the planning time frame, and the consideration that the city's household growth is forecasted to increase um, by only 10 households by 2040. Council staff finds that this is not an underutilization of the wastewater system, which is where some of this tension comes from, um, and the relatively small amount of growth forecasted um, means that the plan is not more likely than not to have a substantial impact on or contain a substantial departure from metropolitan system plans. Um, and perhaps it would be helpful to note that this is a similar determination to the 2030 plan. Um, so for uh, existing land use, as you can see, um, we have primarily residential uses. Uh, the large, darker green space is a property known as the Country Club, um, and the light green um, spaces are regular parks and open space in the city of Minnetonka. Um, and then the 2040 plan land use um, is essentially the same. The only difference is that those uh, five acres, I think it's about seven lots, as I said, um, are no longer vacant in the 2040 scenario in front of you. Um, so the proposed findings for today are that the plan um, does conform to metropolitan system plans, but is inconsistent with council wastewater land use and housing policies. Um, and it is compatible with the plans of adjacent local governmental units and affected jurisdictions. And so uh, the meeting scheduled, because the community is fully sewered, they'll be on the Environment Committee agenda on Tuesday, August 27th, and to be heard by the Metropolitan Council on Wednesday, September 25th. Um, and as I said, uh, Beth Elliott is representing the city of Minnetonka Beach today. She's here. If there is any questions, uh, Ms. Barajas or I cannot answer. Um, so you have before you the proposed answer or action, sorry, to authorize the city of Minnetonka Beach, place its 2040 comprehensive plan into effect and to strongly encourage the city to link housing needs with housing tools and to address all widely known housing tools as detailed in housing advisory comments in the review record in order to be fully consistent with council housing policies, and then to advise the city to implement the advisory comments in the review record for um, surface water management, land use, and of course those housing um, advisory comments. So with that, I will be um, happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Questions on that report? Council Member Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just curious on those seven vacant lots, are, are those cases where people bought two lots and built on one, or who owns the vacant lots? Mr. Riley. That's a, that, uh, Chair Lilligan, I'm sorry, Council Member Wolf, I'm not sure the answer to that question. I can certainly get back to you with the answer. It's not going to make a difference on how I vote. I'm just curious, because <laughs> I, I know when in Lakeville, if there's a vacant lot in a very fully developed for a long time neighborhood, it's usually when somebody bought a second sure. lot. Mr. Uh, Riley. Chair Lilligan, if I might add, it sounds like potentially that's part of their vacant turnover as well, that they were identified at the time as being for sale um, and they haven't yet been purchased. So that's another option. Thank you. Further questions on this report? If not, Mr. Riley, as a proposed action, is there a motion? So moved. Second. Thank you. Discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Ms. Elliott, thanks for being here. Thanks for your work on this. We'll move on to our sixth business item, 2019-235 JT, the City of Oakdale 2040 Comprehensive Plan and Comprehensive Sewer Plan. Uh, Ms. Wendell, welcome. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Council Members. Um, before you today, well, I should introduce myself first. Um, my name is Kryn Wendell. I'm sector representative for districts 11 and 12, which include Oakdale. Um, I'd like to let the committee know that we have two members from Oakdale here. We have Bob Streeter, the community development director, and Emily Shively, the planner from Oakdale, here with us. Thank you Could for you being have here. Any questions of them uh, after the presentation. And so before you today is a review of the city of Oakdale's 2040 comprehensive plan. 
the map for you shows the regional systems uh, and the components within the city of Oakdale. And so we have Interstate 694 going through the center of the city from north to south. Uh, they do have Interstate 94 that runs along the southern border of the city. Uh, they also have um, Highway 36 and the Gateway State Trail uh, within their community. Um, and that's the northern part of the city. And then there's also one lift station located within the city boundaries. Uh, Thrive MSP 2040 has designated the city as suburban, as shown on the map here. And Oakdale is located on the western border of Washington County and is surrounded by the communities of Matamidi and Pine Springs, Lake Elmo, Woodbury, Maplewood, North St. Paul, and White Bear Lake. In terms of their forecasted growth, uh, Table 1 shown here and in your staff report, between 2020 and 2040, the council forecasts show that the city will grow by around 6,400 people, representing <coughs> 2,900 jobs, or excuse me, 2,900 households, um, with an increase of 800 jobs within the city in the same time frame. In terms of their planned residential density, in Table 2 in the staff report and shown here, um, shows the residential density of the suburban areas uh, within the city. And so the overall guided uh, residential land is expected to be between um, 6.93 and 35.40 uh, units per acre. And so communities with that suburban designation under Thrive are expected to plan for forecasted population and household growth at the average density of at least five units per acre, and then also target opportunities for more intensive development near regional transit investments um, at densities and in a matter um, articulated in the 2040 uh, Transportation Policy Plan. And so Oakdale's plan is consistent with this policy. In terms of the existing land use, um, as shown in figure three, the existing land use uh, development pattern includes a majority of single family um, residential at 30, about 34%. Um, they also have some mixed housing in that twin, tri, and quad land use category. Um, they also have a variety of recreation and institutional land uses. Uh, they also have a long history of protecting natural resources, including tree canopy and open space, uh, wetlands, and public waters. And then for the 2040 planned land use, um, the plan does outline several areas of new development and redevelopment shown in figures four and six um, in the staff report, which includes a mixed use residential development um, near I-694 and 40th Street. Um, there's about 27 acres for mixed use development near I-94. And then um, over 20 acres uh, allocated for the Bus Rapid Transit Oriented Development, or BRTOD, um, at the planned Helmo station. And so the city is planning for higher residential <coughs> densities in that area, um, including mixed use residential, high density residential, um, as high as 55 units um, per acre. Yeah. And as part of that, I'd like to highlight that specifically, um, as we're talking about the Metro Gold Line um, partners and those along the Gold Line, uh, Oakdale has uh, really been in the forefront of planning for their station. Um, they actually did a small area plan back in 2018 that highlighted this development pattern, uh, which is attached as Appendix C within the plan. And so it shows you the orientation of those land uses and how they are oriented to I-94. Um, and they support all of the policies for the BRTOD. And so I'd like to um, also commend the city for uh, advancing this planning effort ahead of their conference plan and then integrating those policies with the goals um, and objectives that they have. And so with that, uh, the proposed findings is that the plan conforms to the Metropolitan System plans, is consistent with council policies, is compatible with the plans of adjacent and local governmental units and affected jurisdiction, uh, their meeting schedule, similar to others, uh, they will be seen by the Environment Committee on August 27th and by the full council on September 25th. And for the proposed action um, to authorize the City of Oakdale to place its 2040 Conference of Plan into effect and to advise the city to implement the advisory comments and the review record for transit and surface water management. And so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions or um, of the uh, members from the city as well. Thank you, Ms. Wendell. Questions on that report? Council Member Um, Mr. Chair, uh, I move approval of the City okay. of Oakdale's plan. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. And Council Member Bento. And Bob and Emily, to you and your colleagues and the Council, kudos. Um, for those of you who haven't
gotten off the freeways or Highway 36 to really explore Oakdale, I encourage you to. It's a great community. It's a hop, skip, and a jump from where I live, and I spend a lot of time and a fair amount of money there. Um, <laughs> great shopping, great movie theaters, great restaurants, beautiful parks, and just a really cool community. They also have a fabulous farmer's market. So um, Oakdale is, is a great spot. Well, one of the interesting things about Oakdale is that it started out as a township back in the 1850s, and its name was selected by a, a Scot by the name of... Um, Arthur Stephen, and it was based on um, the fact that there were a, a grove of oak trees. And so it started out as a township, and in the 70s, Oakdale and Northdale Township did some reorganizing and created the city of Oakdale, and there's been some growth since then, and it's today a great spot, and it's going to continue to be. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Council Member. Thanks for being here tonight, for sure. Congratulations on your work. Uh, any further discussion on the... Uh, Motion, Council Member Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just trying to figure out how it ended up with that big vacant area with everything else being developed. It looks like it was maybe a farm that the farmer held out after everybody else developed around, or what happened there? Ms. Wendell. I uh, guess, um, Mr. Chair and Council Member, um, in that area that is going to be slated for a new um, development, is, is that where I'm thinking? Okay, that's yes. Good I don't know. Would um, Mr. Streeter, could I invite him up to come up and describe that area? It's very an um, important piece uh, to the city. Please. Mr. Streeter, would you? Mr. Streeter, welcome. Come and... uh, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, the area that you're asking about is 208 acres. It was uh, sold by 3M a couple years ago to a local developer and uh, the city did a master plan and it'll be uh, around 1,400 units. We'll have multifamily, some affordable housing, townhomes, single family, and uh, we should start construction sometime next year. Great, congratulations, thank you. Further discussion on the motion, Council Member Atlas Singer Britson. Thank you, Chair. There's two things I'd like to highlight. One, um, I just love the um, BRT LOD um, plan and um, want to just call out and highlight the wonderful inclusion of a great deal of green space in that. And um, it's just something that in my work, I'm talking with communities all the time that feel like they missed an opportunity in a space and it's so hard to get it back. So I just want to say kudos on that. And the other thing I'd like to share is that I took my team from Minneapolis Public Schools a number of years ago and we drove to Oakdale just to get to a restaurant called Katrina's. Oh. Um, and now Katrina's has several locations. One's not that far from here and I often go there um, after late meetings um, to get a fix, but it's a wonderful Mexican restaurant with a lot of wonderful choices. So, and the first one was in Oakdale. And so we heard about it and that was one of our team building experiences was to go for lunch together and, and explore culture in a different community and it was a wonderful experience. So I'm borrowing from council member Wolf's <laughs> Restaurant practice. reviews, uh, great. Further discussion on Councilmember Vento's motion? Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you, Ms. Wendell. Again, thanks to our guests for being here. Our next item is 2019-236 JT, the City of Columbia Heights 2040 Comprehensive Plan and Comprehensive Sewer Plan. Uh, Mr. Wycheck, welcome. Thank you, Chair Lilligren. Um, as the chair mentioned, my name is Eric Wycheck. I'm a sector representative for districts two, nine, and 10 in the local planning assistance group um, in community development. Uh, I'd like the committee to know that we have two guests here representing the city of Columbia Heights. Elizabeth Hammond, the city planner is here in the audience. And Lance Bernard from HKGI is also in the audience. Thank you for being here. I worked quite closely with Elizabeth very early on when I started here at the council. I think not long after system statements were released in 2015, I think it was one of the first communities that I visited. I think they were pretty eager to get going on the plan. So uh, it's a huge accomplishment for Columbia Heights. So before you today um, is the review of the City of Columbia Heights 2040 plan. My presentation not up. Oh, here it comes. There we go. Great. 
This map shows the location of regional system components within the city of Columbia Heights. There are no interstates within the city's boundaries, although the plan does note that University Avenue and Central Avenue, both minor arterials uh, linked the city to I-694. All wastewater generated within the city is conveyed through council interceptors, and there are no regional park system components in the city. Thrive MSP 2040 has designated the city as urban center. Columbia Heights is located in Southern Anoka County. It is surrounded by the communities of Fridley, New Brighton, St. Anthony and Minneapolis. The city of Hilltop is entirely enclosed within the city. Table one also within your staff report shows that between 2020 and 2040, the council forecasts the city will grow by 2,600 people, representing 900 households. There will be an increase of 320 jobs in the city during that same time frame. In terms of planned residential density, table two from the staff report shown here illustrates that planned residential density in the urban center area of the city. The overall density for guided residential land is expected to be between 20.2 seven, nine units per acre and 43.73 units per acre. Communities within the urban center designation under Thrive are also expected to plan for forecasted growth, population growth at overall average minimum densities of at least 20 units per acre for new development and redevelopment and target opportunities for more intensive development near regional transit investments at densities and in a manner articulated in the 2040 transportation policy plan. Columbia Heights is consistent with uh, both these policies. As you might expect, the city's existing land use map um, consists of a lot of uh, predominantly residential uses at 54%. Um, but you also have commercial, existing commercial and office space and industrial areas, which are near transportation corridors. And appro approximately, well, just short of 6% of the city is parks and open space. This planned land use map is uh, from figure four in the staff report. It identifies development and redevelopment opportunities throughout the city. The plan identifies two mixed use land use categories called TOD and transitional, located primarily where Central Avenue intersects with 40th Avenue Northeast in the city and where 40th Avenue Northeast intersects with University Avenue Northeast. These areas uh, focus on redevelopment, infill, and reinvestment near transportation and transit connections. The pr proposed findings before you today are that uh, the plan conforms with metropolitan system plans, is consistent with council policies, as, and is compatible with the plans of adjacent local governmental units and effective jurisdictions. The meeting schedule is similar to what you've seen in the other presentations today with uh, uh, the plan going before the environmental community, uh, the environment Com committee on August 27th, and before the full Metropolitan Council on September 25th. Now, I'd just like to reiterate that um, Elizabeth Hammond and uh, Lance Bernard are in the audience with us today. So, your proposed action today is to authorize the City of Columbia Heights to place its 2040 conference of plan into effect and advise the city to implement the advisory comments in the review record for forecast and water supply. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Whiting. Any questions on this report? Uh, no questions, but Seeing I'd like to make Council a motion Chambliss. to approve. Great. Council Member Chambliss has made a motion to approve the action. Is there a second? Second. Great. Discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, uh, thank you, Ms. Ham and Mr. Bernard for being here today. and. Uh, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Whitecheck. We'll move on to the eighth business item tonight. That's 2019 203, the Kingswood Special Recreation Feature Acquisition Master Plan Amendment and Boundary Amendment for the Three Rivers Park District. And that will be Mr. Collins. Welcome. Yes, good afternoon, Chair Lilligren and Council Members. I am or Mr. Kelly. Kelly. Yeah, Regional Parks sorry. Planning Analyst, uh, <laughs> and I'm here to present Kingswood Special Recreation Features uh, Acquisition Master Plan Amendment and Boundary Adjustment. 
First off, some context. Uh, Kingswood is located in the western part of the regional park system in western Hennepin County in the city of Minatrista. This is figure one in your staff report. Zooming in a bit to the northern portion of the Three Rivers Park District system, you can see in the map on the left that Kingswood is located just north of Gail Woods Farm, special recreation feature. This coincides with figure two in your staff report. Both of these special recreation features are planned to be connected by the council approved Baker Carver Regional Trail that will ultimately connect the park reserves and the trail's name, along with other state and regional recreation units, including the Loose Line State Trail, the Dakota Rail Regional Trail, and Lake Minnetonka Regional Park. The planned trail corridor is indicated in the map on the left by the dashed green line. Kind of hard to see, but it's there. The map on the right is Kingswood itself, and you can see here that much of the unit surrounds Little Long Lake, a 65-acre water body with a maximum depth of 76 feet. The park includes holdings on both the east and west sides of the lake, counting for about 70% of the shoreline and encompassing a substantial portion of the lake's watershed, resulting in a rare opportunity to significantly preserve and protect Little Long Lake. More on Little Lake in just a moment. First, let's talk about the Special Recreation Features Boundary and the acquisition location itself. The Kingswood SRF Master Plan Boundary includes 124 acres currently owned by Three Rivers Park District and almost 16 acres currently held by a private party but subject to a purchase agreement with Three Rivers Park District. That parcel is the focus of this acquisition master plan amendment and is highlighted in the map on the left in the southwest corner. This is figure three in the staff report. The addition of the almost 16 acre undeveloped property would increase the size of the special recreation feature to about 140 acres and will further support the intent of the original 2013 acquisition master plan, which is the long term protection of Little Long Lake, considered to be one of the most pristine lakes in Hennepin County and the metro area more broadly. This is the last remaining private property directly on the northern portion of the lake and is located just south of and immediately adjacent to parkland acquired as a result of the January 2019 council approved acquisition master plan amendment. The Minnesota land cover classification system designates approximately half of the property as high quality maple basswood forest and the other half as cultivated vegetation. Although an on-site inspection by Three Rivers Park District revealed the area is predominantly open field. There are also smaller areas of wetlands and of particular interest, Little Long Lake shoreline. The long-term natural resource plan for the property is to maintain the high quality maple basswood forest and either expand that community west into the open field or restore the open field to prairie. With regard to natural resource significance, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources ranks about half of the property as a three, which is the highest possible ranking. Areas ranked as three are typically larger in size and surrounded by complementary land cover and uses and are more ecologically diverse. Again, the addition of the almost 16 acre undeveloped property will further support the intent of the original 2013 acquisition master plan, which is the long-term protection of Little Long Lake. Council staff find that the acquisition master plan amendment is consistent with the requirements of the 2040 Regional Parks Policy Plan, particularly Planning Strategy 1, Master Planning, and other council policies. And so the action before you is that the Metropolitan Council approved the Three Rivers Park District's Kingswood Special Recreation Feature Acquisition Master Plan Amendment, approved the boundary adjustment adding 15.95 acres of high quality natural resource land on Little Long Lake in the city of Minnetrista, and informed Three Rivers Park District that it must submit the Kingswood Special Recreation Feature Development Master Plan for Metropolitan Council approval prior to requesting funding for development. I should note the proposed action was approved unanimously by the Metropolitan Parks and Open Space Commission at its meeting on August 1st, 2019. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelly, for that report and for your work on this. Any questions on that report? Councilmember Johnson. So I just want to make sure I'm on the same page. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I just, is the, and maybe I'm, I'm reading a different, it's just slightly different than the one that's online, the presentation. 
my are you looking at the next agenda item uh, maybe i am there well, I maybe should i help. am you know what i'm on the wrong one <laughs> well, okay, I wonder... two. <laughs> okay the next presentation we'll wait. will detail yep. the yep, uh, you're right paof yep 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 yes. sorry about that no problem thank you uh, questions on the report Councilmember Lindstrom. what's the definition of a special recreation feature it looks like a park to me yeah oh yeah <laughs> what's the difference between a park Mr. Kelly. what's so special about this uh, feature well wow. chair Lilligren, um <laughs> council member um special recreation features are a uh, special des insane. designation in our regional park system um they're a little bit different than a regional park which is typically between 200 and 500 acres or a park reserve which is typically uh, can be more than a thousand acres and 80% uh, of those park reserves are uh, developed and uh, undeveloped uh, in perpetuity. Um, so special recreation features, um, some you might be familiar with, um, similar uh, to Kingswood uh, Square Lake in Washington County you might be familiar with, also known for its um, uh, very high and pristine water quality, um, but also a smaller acreage. Um, others, I mentioned uh, Gale Woods Farm, uh, a little bit different than a regional park where it focuses more on uh, farm or agricultural education um, than it does on uh, other more uh, typical regional park activities that focus on uh, hiking and uh, bicycling and things like that. Um, so those are just a couple of examples for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that uh, definition. Further questions on the report? Seeing none, Mr. Kelly brings a proposed action before us. Is there a motion? I would move approval. Thank you, Councilmember Wolf. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. Oh, I am so sorry. <laughs> I'll go too quickly. Councilmember Wolf. I just wanted to comment that I've been out there because MPOS toured it several years ago, and it's an amazing property. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, one of those spectacular bodies of water that it's great that we can keep it from being uh, degraded by development and people like to to scuba dive there so similar to what they do at Square Lake because of the water quality. Thank you for sharing that. Any further discussion on the motion? Now seeing none, all in <laughs> approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you, Mr. Kelly, for your Thank work you. on this and for the report. And our final business item on the agenda is 2019-204 Park Acquisition Opportunity Fund Grant for Kingswood Special Recreation Feature, Three Rivers Park District. Ms. Lee, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. For the record, my name is Jessica Lee. I'm the Grants Administrator for Parks. And I'm here to talk about business item 2019-204 Park Acquisition Opportunity Fund Grant for Kingswood Special Recreation Feature, the Baker property for Three Rivers Park District. And I apologize, you've already seen some of these slides in the previous presentation. As you know, Kingswood Special Recreation Features in Western Hennepin County. Um, on the right, you can see the current parcels of Kingswood in the shaded green. And it's important to note that Kingswood is 100% owned by Three Rivers Park District. Um, acquiring this property of approximately 16 acres will increase the size of the Special Recreation Feature to 140 acres. Um, and it will uh, afford additional protection to Little Long Lake, approximately 680 feet of shoreline. And I'll just also add that I had, um, I was able to visit this park last week with Three Rivers Park staff, and it is an incredibly pristine lake, and there were a couple kids scuba diving when I was there. Wow. <laughs> so our rationale for recommendation is this acquisition is consistent with the 2040 Regional Parks Policy Plan, State Fiscal Year 2016 Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund Appropriation Requirements, the Kingswood Special Recreation Feature Master Plan, as amended with concurrent business item 2019-203, and Three Rivers Park District is within its $1.7 million per year limit for ENRTF PAOF funding. The purchase price of this parcel is $715,000, which is 100% of the appraised value. Along with very minimal stewardship and closing costs, the total project is $730,000. The grant structure is um, split between Environment Natural Resource Trust Fund and Council Bonds for a total grant of $547,500, and Three Rivers will provide a local match of 25% of $182,500. With that, our recommendations today 
are to approve a grant of up to $547,500 to Three Rivers Park District to acquire the 15.95 acre acre property located at 1755 Retreat Circle in the city of Minnetrista for Kingswood Special Recreation Feature and authorize the Community Development Director to execute the grant agreement and restrictive covenant on behalf of the Council and to consider reimbursing Three Rivers Park District up to $182,500 for its share of a future regional parks capital bonding program and inform Three Rivers Park District that the Council does not under any circumstance represent or guarantee that the Council will grant future reimbursement and that exp expenditure of local funds never entitles a park agency to reimbursement and inform Three Rivers Park District that the funds must be incurred before the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund appropriation ends on June 30th of 2020. With that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Uh, any questions on that report? Any questions? <clears throat> Seeing none, Ms. Lee has brought recommendations forward. Is there a motion to approve? Move approval, second. Thank you, council members. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Thank you, Ms. Thank Lee. you. We will move on to our information item. Uh, visualing travel to regional parks using location-based services data. Mr. Hudding, welcome. Uh, thank you, Chair, members. Um, I'm Joel Hudding. I lead the research team in community development. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we have been exploring the use of uh, location-based services data from cell phones to understand visitation to regional parks. Um, and the first thing I just want to kind of get out of the way is that we are definitely not talking about tracking individuals. So we don't have any information, and it's impossible within the data. It's even impossible for the vendor that sells us the data to see individual um, uh, personally identifiable information within the data. So we're looking at we're looking at patterns of travel. We're not looking at um, we're not looking at individual um, individual travel. Um, so this data source has been used pretty extensively at the council. Um, we we use it in transportation analysis all the time. MnDOT uses it. Um, uh, different county governments within Minnesota use it, and the same data source has been used in analyses uh, in all 48 states, Canada, and Mexico. So it's it's pretty ubiquitous in terms of um, analyzing transportation within the United States, Canada, and Mexico. I think what makes it um, what makes it unique is that we're using it to visualize travel to regional parks, which is a new use case. Um, of the data, and it's really unlocked, I think, some unprecedented ins insights about visitation to our regional park system. Um, so um, everyone can follow along if you'd like, or do this on your own time, uh, whatever you prefer. Uh, but um, what we are talking about is location-based services on, um, on cell phones. So here are the instructions. If you're an iPhone user or an Android user, you can follow these. Uh, when I go to mine, I get to privacy, I click on location services, and I see that all these apps know my location. Um, so Bird knows my location when I'm using it. Um, Facebook, while I'm using it, Google Maps always, always knows my location. <laughs> um, uh, and I go, and I go down to the list to a bunch of apps that I don't even realize that I add on here. Um, but in any case, um, that, that is the ultimate source of, of the data. Um, and then those data are collected and aggregate, first anonymized and then aggregated and they go through all this process before they, um, before they actually get to us. Um, so just a few other points on the data. Um, I've already talked about the first couple bullets here. Um, but just for your knowledge, there's about 23% of the U.S. and Canadian population within this data, database. Um, and, and so Streetlight is the company that actually sells us the data, and they're processing about 60 billion location records per month. Um, so enormous amounts of, uh, of data, which give us these incredibly large sample sizes that allow us to do these really granular analyses of, um, of travel that you just simply wouldn't be able to get in any sort of um, cost-effective way through traditional research methods. Um, and 
So you get a lot more than just um, travel information. You get um, you get information about demographics of visitors, and those are inferred. And I'll I'll get into how that's done. Um, you can do an analysis of visitor um, where their home work location is, and by that I'm talking census block group level. Um, and just for reference, a census block group. Um, on average in the region contains around um, around 1,500 to 1,700 uh, people. Um, so that's that's the level of granularity where we're looking at uh, home locations. So that's that, that, that should illustrate how we can't uh, like understand anything about individual travel. Um, and there are a lot of different types of analysis available, whether that's origin destination, understanding where people are coming from, where they're going, um, uh, how many people go take a particular path? And what are some statistics on the travel modes that people take? So do, do they uh, do they ride their bike? Do they walk? Do they take transit? Um, those sorts of things. A question from Council Member Chambliss. Um, yes, I, I <coughs> and if you can flip back to the previous slide, the travel mode and uh, well, in particular, the visit home work location, the census block groups, uh, I believe there is a way to identify the demographics for the census block group, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Mr. Heading. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, council member, yes, I will. I am about to get into how oh. that's um, how that's done. But yes, you're you're absolutely right. That's what they're doing. They're using the census demographics. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Heading. Okay, so how are they doing this? Um, they first, they infer the home location and then they're estimating uh, the demographics based on the census, uh, census information of uh, that home location. Um, and then they're inferring the travel uh, characteristics based on um, elements of the travel. So things like speed. Um, you can imagine that if a person is traveling at an average rate of three miles per hour, um, as opposed to 50 miles per hour, it would be pretty easy to, to determine um, travel mode. But it, of course, gets a lot more complicated than that. Um, so here's how this works. Um, so this is what Streetlight sees. This is the company that's, uh, that sells the data to us and MnDOT and others. Um, they see a couple of question marks. So they see some census blocks and they see a cell phone travel from one census block to the other census block. And they don't know what, um, they don't know who that is. They just know there's a cell phone moving. And then about nine hours later, that same uh, cell phone goes back to this other um, uh, census block. And then it's nighttime. That cell phone stays in that location for 15 hours or so. And, um, and then the next day, that cell phone goes to a daycare center and then goes back to this other place. They spend another nine hours um, or eight hours or however long people work. Um, at this place, um, and then they stop and they get some pizza, maybe, mm -hmm. um, and then they go back to this other location, and again, they repeat this cycle where they stay there for 15 hours or so. Um, I forgot their poor kid at the daycare. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I knew there was a hole. <laughs> and they left their kid at the daycare. That's problematic. Um, and so it, it becomes really easy to, with a high degree of probability, to be able to infer where the person is, where the person works, and where the person lives. Um, and again, they're doing this at this, this aggregated geography. So they're not looking at an individual traveling to an individual house. Um, and so now there are some differences in smartphone ownership rates. Um, and these differences have actually really shrunk over time uh, to the point where uh, there really aren't significant differences across race um, in smartphone ownership, where there still continue to be some differences um, tend to be that older, uh, older adults um, still have uh, slightly lower smartphone ownership rates, but th that gap is really even changing on that end as well. But Streetlight does a lot of things to, um, to account for this and at least account for this spatially. Um, and so um, this is just a really s simplified version of what they're doing. But you can imagine in one census block, um, they know how many people live there because we have public data on how many people live in different places. And they also know how many phones are in their database um, from that same location. Um, and so they if, they, if they, in this first example, um, census block one, 
Um, there are 10 people living there. There are five phones that are there. And the other one, there are three phones there and 10 people um, uh, living there. Um, so they will weigh those records um, uh, more um, so that if a person makes a trip from block two, they're going to count more than a person that makes a block uh, a trip from block one because um, they're not as well represented um, in the data set. Um, so just kind of playing that forward, how that might play out. Um, here are some people visiting the Chain of Lakes Regional Park. Um, and you can see that uh, people that are coming from block two um, are weighed a little bit higher. And so they count as more visits because they're counting for that difference, that spatial difference in smartphone um, representation within their database. Um, and so when I when I talk about the census block group level, um, this is this is an illustration of what that looks like. And that, so this is um, visualizing home census blocks, um, uh, census block groups of people that are visiting Theodore Worth uh, Regional Park. And Theodore Worth is um, outlined in white. Um, I guess it's not showing up particularly well on here. Um, but you can see that's that's sort of the level of geography that we're talking about. So the the more the darker the deeper colors, um, that means more people are coming from that location um, than from, from other locations. Um, okay, so just a quick refresher on what we do in terms of parks visitation research. Um, so, so two of our major um, programs, we do the annual use estimate. So that's a count of how many people are visiting the regional parks. Um, and then we do the visitor study, and the visitor study is our, our way of figuring out what are the demographics of visitors, what is the percent that come from within that same jurisdiction or from different jurisdictions, um, and then we get a, a couple other key inputs that go in, ultimately go into the use estimate and then become part of the funding formula. So that's, um, that's sort of the background of um, parks visitation research. The problem is that all of this research is done with statistically valid data at the agency level and at the system level. So that means we don't actually know anything about the demographics of visitors to any specific park. And it's that park level data, it's that information where, where a lot of decisions are being made, right? Um, programming decisions are made at the park level, um, all sorts of planning decisions are made. Um, and um, and we don't we don't actually have data on data at that level. Um, so Streetlight has really been um, really been showing um, a lot of promise in being able to provide that park level information about um, about visitation. Um, but what we do want to do for sure is that we want to compare it to some. Um, additional data collection. And so that's part of what we're doing in the 2020 Parks Visitor Study is we want to um, collect some additional park level data that we can use to compare to Streetlight to, just to see what those differences might be. Um, so uh, we do have some park level data though, and some of you may be familiar with this, um, but back in 2016, the University of Minnesota did um, uh, did some research where they collected park level information as part of um, validating this statewide uh, methodology for conducting visitor studies in parks. Um, and we've been able to take the data that we have for our regional parks and compare it to Streetlight just to see how the two, um, how the two line up. And, and in general, Streetlight is suggesting um, a little bit more uh, non-local travel um, than, uh, than the U of M um, suggests. Um, Streetlight is suggesting there are slightly more people of color visiting the, the regional parks um, that we looked at and um, slightly more lower income visitors uh, than was seen in the U of M study. Um, so when we're doing these comparisons, um, I think it's really important to just kind of qualitatively think about what, we're, what it is that we're doing. Um, it's not that one source of data is the ground truth and the other source um, it, it's not like we're comparing Streetlight to the ground truth, which is an intercept survey. Both, both types of data sources can have different advantages and disadvantages. Um, and so we're really making this, um, it's, it's, to some extent, it's a qualitative assessment. So what you're looking at here is these travel sheds, um, which starts to get into, I think, the fun part of the, um, of the presentation. Um, so on the left, what you're, well, in both of these maps, you're looking at the home zip codes of people who visited um, Central Mississippi uh, Riverfront Regional Park um, in the summer of 2016. Um, and you can see the streetlight uh, map on the left and the University of Minnesota map on the right. 
Um, and to me, um, people who people who watch um, election results come in at night, um, you start to see <laughs> um, things come in. It starts to fill in. It jumps around a little bit, and then after soon enough, um, the picture starts to become clear. And that's what this sort of looks like to me: is you have these enormous sample sizes coming out of streetlight, and you see this travel shed that really makes a lot of sense. Um, and the University of Minnesota it, it survey researchers not saying anything negative about the study at all. It's just it just points out how difficult it is to collect um, uh, intercept based survey data um, so that they collected about 400 records with a lot of hard work um, mm -hmm. and um, and you just simply can't get the kinds of sample sizes that you would get out of um, out of streetlight. So comparing some of the key statistics. Um, so what you're looking at here is three regional parks, um, and you're looking at um, local and non-local visitation comparing streetlight to the University of Minnesota study. Um, and what, what we're looking at here is lo the percent local and percent non-local visitation. And you can see they're a bit different um, uh, for at least two of the parks. Um, so for both Bryant Lake uh, Regional Park and Central Mississippi Riverfront Regional Park, um, you can see that Streetlight is, est is estimating that there's a lot more non-local visitation than uh, the U of M uh, study. And, and the, the estimate is well outside the margin of error um, for the U of M uh, study. Whereas Lebanon Hills, it's a little bit closer. Um, now, I'll just take you back to this map. So here's where we're thinking about this, and we're thinking, okay, well, Streetlight suggests there's a lot more non-local visitation than the U of M study. Well, this, these are the maps of that visitation. Um, and the question we'll have to ask ourselves when we're, when we're, when we're evaluating this is, which one of these are we going to trust? Which one is right? Um, and, you know, I, I think I know what I would do if I were looking at these two maps and making that assessment. But, you know, again, there's going to need to be a lot more rigorous um, analysis to compare these. Um, so looking at demographics, um, so I mentioned um, race is a, a thing that Streetlight is inferring. Um, and I would say these pretty much lined up with, uh, with what the U of M visitor study came up with. Um, you can see um, they're really pretty close across the board. So this is Central Mississippi Riverfront. This is Bryant Lake, and this is Lebanon Hills. They move directionally in the way you would expect. So as I go from Central Mississippi Mississippi to Bryant Lake and Lebanon Hills, you can see there's a little bit more white visitation in, um, in these other parks, which makes sense. Um, the problem is, of course, that uh, the U of M, uh, they didn't really collect any data on parks that are really in close proximity to large populations of color. Um, and, and because of that, you end up with these um, racial demographics that look a lot like the region. And so it's maybe not, it's not, maybe not a a full analysis to be able to um, compare the two. Um, so we've we've done some additional um, additional park level uh, demographic analysis just to see what Streetlight is doing, and things um, things pretty much move as um, as we would expect. Um, so here is um, is a couple here are a couple of maps, um, and these are the parks that we chose to analyze for this. Um, so we looked at Theodore Wirth, which is in uh, very close proximity to a large black population in North Minneapolis. Um, we looked at Nokomis Hiawatha. Um, that's a place that is, um, it, it's, um, it is in a predominantly white area, but it's, it's fairly close to um, uh, uh, populations of color. Um, and then Phelan, um, over up in the upper right, of course, is in very close proximity to a large Asian population. And then as a reference, um, Spring Lake down in Dakota County um, is, uh, is, is close to, to a large white population. So we just wanted to see directionally, how did these line up? Um, and, and they do directionally line up the way you would expect. Um, so uh, the bars on the, the far left, um, th that's the percent of, of white visitors. Um, and you can see Spring Lake is the one that's in Dakota County that we're looking at. Um, it's uh, close to a very large white population, and it has the highest white visitation. Whereas Phelan, on the other hand, very close to um, that Asian population, uh, about 40% of the vis visitation at Phelan seems to be from people of color, um, which is interesting. You also see that Phelan has a, a lot more Asian, vi Asian visitors. Um, 
and the trend uh, the trend kind of carries forward for the other parks as well. Um, uh, and I'll get to Theodore Worth in in a minute. Um, and I think that's where the conversation starts to get really interesting. Um, but um, you can see that Theodore Worth being directly proximate to that very large black uh, population, you might expect visitation there to be a little bit more, uh, uh, a little bit higher percent black than, um, than what is showing up here. Um, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, so this, this is another thing that I find pretty compelling. Um, so what we're looking at here is income uh, of visitors at central Mississippi Riverfront comparing the U of M study to Streetlight again. And uh, what you see, an interesting thing in this plot is that the, the lower end of the income spectrum in the Uni University of Minnesota study, um, you see that it's very different than what Streetlight is coming up with in terms of that distribution. You see that in the middle of the income range and all the way to the um, highest end of the income range, they're pretty close. Um, they follow each other pretty closely. Um, but on the left side of the income distribution, there's just these, these what have apparently huge gaps in the University of Minnesota study. And so what could be going on here is that lower income people are less likely to want to report their income for whatever reason on an intercept-based survey. And, and those are showing up as missing records in the data. And so this may challenge some of the narrative that we've been putting forward where we, um, where we see that parks visitors tend to skew higher income, um, this could challenge it. It could be simply that, that lower income people um, are more likely to not uh, uh, report their income. That's a possibility. In any case, um, Streetlight ap appears to be picking up um, those records in other ways. Mr. Hunting, question from Council Member Chambliss. Um, thank you, Chair. Mr. Hunting, I just am curious about the um, the visitor study, you know, I, I don't know if that's on paper or if it's just asking people questions as compared to the intercept study. Um, so you're able to figure out based on the census data what and the travel data what the actual income probably is versus what they're reporting. Is that is that what I'm getting at? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, Councilman Berg, yes, that's that's exactly um, <clears throat> that's exactly right. Okay, and I don't know if you're going to talk about this a little bit later, but I would just like to know um, one: um, how much does the research cost, and how how long are we going to be doing the study? I know we've been talking about this a few times um, with the council, and. I guess I have this, I guess my perspective is that we do a lot of studies um, to, of demographic information at a lot of cost. Um, and uh, I'm not sure you know, what the theory was before doing the study, because usually you kind of have a theory, I would imagine, and then you want to see if the study reflects that or maybe we're just doing a study because that's our analytical process. Um, can, you, can you talk about what the value of this study is and why we're doing it? I, I know that we are trying to identify the interests of our park visitors, the interests of um, people of color and trying to get pe more people of color to our regional park systems. Um, and then what are the next steps? after we look at this re research and what kind of decision points are you looking for? Mr. Hardy. Uh, Mr. Chair, council member. Um, okay, so there are a lot of really great questions. Um, and I think I will partially answer some of them in terms of um, what would we use this information for? Um, I'll answer those, I think, um, particularly with regard to uh, demographics um, in the coming slides. Um, However, I'll, I'll, I'll um, address some of the points now. Um, so the one, one piece you asked about is cost. Um, and so we currently do, do the visitor study, um, which is that intercept-based survey research. We do that about every five years. Um, the last one, um, I, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but it cl costs close to 300,000. We're budgeting around 500,000. Um, for the next visitor study. Um, 
Streetlight is essentially free to us. Um, well, it's, it's not free, um, but uh, we, we pay a very small marginal cost because, um, again, this is a large contract between the state of Minnesota and Streetlight. Um, and so the marginal cost for our licenses um, is it's something like $5,000 um, uh, per user per year going forward. So the Streetlight data are, um, are, are quite cheap. Um, in terms of what it costs us as an agency to, to get those, um, uh, especially considering the, the, the level of information that it can provide. Um, and visitor studies, again, that $500,000, that's going to allow us to have agency level demographics, um, system level demographics. It's not gonna give us dem demographics of individual parks. Um, uh, and, um, and again, that's information that is, I think, really useful um, in planning. And, and I have a couple of examples of how that, might, um, how that might be used. You might think that the most basic, at the most basic level, if we have a goal around equity and we want our park system to be equitable, um, the first thing we need to understand is who our visitors are today. If we don't know who our visitors are or who is visiting the regional parks, then we have no way to say that we're improving equity or not improving equity with our investments. Um, so being able to get park level information that tells us who our, who our demographics are, and then we implement some program with Streetlight is, is a really good example of how you can really use this is you can track over time because you're getting near real time data updates and you can see if that intervention, whatever it was, whatever policy change or programming change or whatever it is that um, an agency implements, you can see how that, um, that changes over time. Um, so I hope, I hope that partially. Council Member Karen Yes, I have another, how, you said about every five years for how many, how many studies have we done? Mr. Hunting. Mr. Chair, Council Member, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the last. Um, About how many studies have we done, you said, every five years? Uh, Mr. Chair, Council Member, um, it's every five years going forward. The, the last study was done in 2016, and the study before that was done in 2008. Um, and the next study will be 2020. And then, and then we'll, lining with census, um, we're intending to do it every five years um, going forward. Okay. So right now we spent, we, okay. So if it, um, if it costs five hundred thousand and we've done three studies, it's a million and a half dollars that we've spent for this. Mr. Chair, uh, Council Member, uh, that that that's that's right. Now I I will note that this study, the visitors, this is how we dis, this is how we distribute the funds. So we can't, without, without doing a visitor study to understand things like local, non-local visitation, um, uh, seasonal visitation, all these, these key inputs to the, the funding formulas, we wouldn't have a way to distribute funds to the agencies because funds are distributed in part based on usage of the, of the system. And so um, this has been our way to get data um, that, that supports our allocation of, of, um, of funds to the park agencies. So beyond just demographics, I mean, demographics, I think, are really important for a lot of types of analysis. It's also this particular visitor study is kind of core to uh, what the council does as a, uh, as a fiscal agent. Okay, thank you. Councilman Jones, thank you. Further, uh, more questions, Councilman Blanstrom? So I go to Como Park about <laughs> three times a week, run through the park, maybe four times. And how does uh, Streetlight know that I'm a park visitor as opposed to a part-time employee? Mr. Henning. Mr. Chair, uh, Council Member, yeah, that, that is an awesome question. Um, if you went to Como and you did that um, three times a week and you stayed there for, um, you know, I mean, I think there's there are some instances in which it won't be able to do this very well, but they are inferring home and workplace. And so we, we do see that there are uh, a measurable amount of work trips to regional parks. So we actually see workers within the parks, um, but that would be based on those travel patterns. And typically um, those travel patterns are, are more than three days a week, although I'm sure there are part-time workers and I'm sure they, um, uh, some of those part-time workers um, 
with shorter shifts might be a little bit harder to infer, but mm -hmm. um, but they are they are inferring, and we can separate work trips from uh, recreation trips. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions at this time? Seeing none, Mr. Harvey, please. Okay, so speaking of Como, um, I, I think Como is a fascinating park. Um, I lived in St. Paul for a long time. Um, I'm a, now I guess I'm a chain of lakes person. I live over there um, now. I'm not any person. I, I love, love all the regional parks, of course. <laughs> I love Como. And I will always go to Como a Zoo and Conservatory, or the Conservatory in the winter. Um, mm -hmm. uh, nice save. What? Yeah. Nice save. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we, uh, we use Como because it's, it's complicated. There's a lot going on and we wanted to see if we could use Streetlight to analyze usage within a park. Um, and we really, we see that usage varies by season. It varies by t uh, day of week. It varies by time of day. Um, and we see a lot of dense activity in the places that we would expect to see dense activity. Um, and I'll get into at least some of that here. So this is the Como Regional Park geography. Um, there's a lake, by the lake is a pavilion. Uh, there's a golf course up on the upper left, or the top part of the map. Um, the zoo and conservatory um, and various trails throughout the system. So what we did, we put a, a hex grid over the park and we're essentially just, we're, we're looking at the activity within the park. And so this is all of 2018 that you're, um, you're seeing here. And over by the lake, you see a lot of um, uh, dense visitation at the pavilion. You see a lot of um, that other uh, big dark blob in the, the left part of the map. That's the zoo and conservatory. And then um, it's hard for me to point it out here, but there's that really red, um, mm -hmm. uh, place right under the zoo and conservatory. Mm -hmm. That's, of course, a, a parking lot. Um, <laughs> so, so just comparing summer to winter, I think, is a really interesting thing. So this is summer, and this is winter. Mm -hmm. um, so you see some really striking things. You see, number one, you see overall visitation is a lot, is, is lower. And you see that the visitation in the summer is all over the park, Visitation in the winter is really um, constrained to the trails where it does exist in the park for the most part. Um, there are some people out on the lake um, still in the winter. Um, uh, and I think what's fascinating here is that area right around the conservatory is that those hex grids actually take on the shape of the, um, of the conservatory itself. Um, which is, I think, just really fascinating that you can get this level of information um, about visitation. And so when you think about the council's role, one of the big things that we do, of course, is implement the visitor study. And it, part of that implementation is coming up with a really good sampling plan. And just having this level of information helps us to come up with, uh, with sampling plans that, are, um, uh, that, that we can implement in a much more cost-effective way um, that we can be a lot more confident that we'll be successful in implementing them because we won't be sending people out to some random log to um, stand there and wait for nobody um, to come, which which happens when you when you don't have good information about um, about usage within a park. Um, that's just kind of the nature of it. So this really helps us uh, uh, with things like sampling plan development. And then for the parks agencies, um, the parks agencies are really, they have been really excited about this um, level of information as well. Um, so I'm just going to give another example. And this is, uh, I would still call this proof of concept phase, um, but uh, using the data to do uh, comprehensive equity analysis um, across the system. Um, so one, uh, one big problem that I've already talked about ad nauseum tonight, I think, is that we don't have park level demographic data. And typically when we're doing some sort of equity analysis of this nature, we're talking about comparing demographics of users to demographics of some uh, uh, reference population, right? And so we would say that the demographics of the parks visitors should match the demographics of um, of something. Um, and this is actually in the parks world, this is often a discussion that, that a deliberation that we're having, right? Um, because depending on how you answer the question of what is the reference demographic, um, you're going to come up to completely different conclusions. Um, and Theodore Worth Regional Park really illustrates this well. Um, so if you were to say that the reference population is the region, the region's demographics, you would say that Theodore Worth has more 
percent wise has more uh, percent visitors of color than the, the region as a whole. And you might say, well, Theodore Worth is doing great. Um, on the other hand, you might say, well, let's compare Theodore Worth to Minneapolis, its home jurisdiction. And then you might say, well, actually, Theodore Worth has uh, slightly fewer uh, percent people of color visiting it than the city of Minneapolis as a whole. So you might come to a completely different um, conclusion. And the, the problem is, is what is your reference population when you're drawing from uh, a broad region? And, and that really kind of varies by the part. Um, and so we've been working on trying to develop statistical models to tease these things out. And you can imagine that in the simplest um, in the simplest form, if you were to control for population and maybe some other spatial factors, you would expect that visitation would essentially take on a sort of bullseye shape where um, people that live the closest to the park are the most likely to use it, and that sort of fades as you travel out in distance. Um, and, and so that's, that's sort of the basic concept behind what we're doing. And then if there are holes in that visitation, then that might indicate um, uh, and, and those holes are associated with, um, say, large populations of color, that might, that might indicate that there is a, a disparity in visitation. Um, and so Theodore, and, uh, Theodore Worth is one of the parks that we use for this analysis. So again, it's really close to a large black population, which is, uh, which is shown here um, in North Minneapolis. Um, and, th and that should be ref reflected in the demographics of visitors. And so this is the travel shed. And these are the home census block groups of the visitors to Theodore Worth. And just looking at these two maps back and forth, um, sorry that they don't align and they're different colors and all that, but you can see that it, there almost appears to be a little bit of a hole where that population is. And um, people who have spent time at Theodore Worth um, will, will know that um, the access is not the same on that side of the park as it is down south in Bryn Mawr um, and on the Golden Valley side. And so, um, you know, there could be a number of reasons behind this. And this type of analysis isn't going to tell you um, isn't going to tell you what or why or any of the details, but it can really help to target more qualitative research or more inquiry, um, ethnographic research, things to try to really understand what is going on when race is a significant predictor of visitation. And I think, I think that's one thing we would all agree on is that, is that race shouldn't be a predictor um, of visitation to the regional parks. You got a question from Councilmember Chambliss. Um. So you're saying that race um, may or may not be a predictor of why you're going to the parks. And I know I mentioned this before in terms of, um, you know, and I know it's probably part of your survey, you know, why did you come to the park and how often do you come and what do you enjoy the most about visiting, you know, um, I think a lot can be gathered about that, or you might ask, you know, what kinds, based on the kinds of interests that you have, um, would you come back to the park if we had those interests, if we fulfill those interests at the park? Do you have, do, are we asking those types of questions in the survey? Mr. Honey. Uh, Mr. Chair, Council Member, um, so, Yes, again, we, we struggle with the difficulty of being able to collect a lot of information to be able to do statistically robust analyses at the park level. Um, one of the things we are doing that's a little different in the upcoming 2020 visitor study is we are intentionally um, oversampling at places where we are likely to get uh, uh, more people of color to, un to really be able to do a rigorous analysis um, of what um, what are the differences in activities um, pursued um, and um, things of that nature by different um, different groups of people to be able to do that type of analysis. Um, and there has been a lot of qualitative research outside of this um, uh, where we've really done more of these deep dives into understanding the barriers to usage. Um, and so I guess the, the short answer is there are a lot of different ways uh, we collect data um, and that none of them in isolation provide the whole answer. Um, so qualitative research will help with some of it. Um, some of the survey research will help with, with, uh, with some as well, like the different activities, um, uh, satisfaction, those types of things. Um, and then this type of analysis can really uh, 
work with with both of those other methods to be able to really uh, help us um, target where we might do qualitative research, which is is really very expensive um, to do that type of focus group uh, uh, and and other type of qualitative research work. Um, so this can, I think, can help uh, really target it. So this is an example of where I might want to, um, I want to meet with communities in North Minneapolis to understand what are the barriers um, uh, to visitation. But to be able to do that analysis comprehensively across the system and really identify the places we want to do those deep dives, um, I think, would be great. Okay. Councilmember Wolf, and then Councilmember Johnson. So, I my family was randomly selected to be part of the travel behavior inventory oh, cool. thing that went on earlier this month, and I have to say that it, it went from Sunday to Saturday, and by Monday, everyone in my family hated that app <laughs> <laughs> because it was really inaccurate. At one point, I was home for like 14 hours, and it told me I was in the middle of the trip and couldn't do anything on the app. And I was like, um, <laughs> but uh, Streetlight being just anonymous and not having to answer all of those obtrusive questions like, what is your income? Um, it, to me, seems like a much more user friendly way to gather data than the the app that they use for the travel behavior inventory or the sitting there with your iPad with somebody in a park and asking them all of these intrusive questions. In terms of getting more accurate data for funding distribution, Streetlight looks to me to be superior in terms of really figuring out who's in the park and where they live for the, for the funding formulas. It, it gives you much better data instead of estimating three seasons out of the year and counting one randomly in different places and then extrapolating that over five years, it, it, it sounds like it would give us more accurate funding distribution. The upside of the intrusive one is that it supposedly gives us better data but uh, on why people are in the park, but it leaves out all of the other kinds of parks. You know, we're, we're so focused on regional park, regional park, mm -hmm. regional park, but if people are getting their needs met in a different kind of park, so what? They don't care what kind of park it is. They don't care if it's a, a state park, if it's a regional park, if it's a local park, if they're getting their recreation needs left. And it seems like the thing that we're missing now is the sort of telephone survey or whatever sort of thing where you're reaching out to people not at the park but just mm -hmm. randomly a random sample throughout the region what parks do you go to what do you do when you go there if you don't go to parks why don't you go to parks you know and find out more broadly park usage that it seems like our visitor study that we do that we did every 10 years and that was way too far apart now doing it every five years is rapidly turning into a dinosaur because it's not giving us very much information for what you spend to have the, the test. So I guess I would like to see us, it probably takes some legislative action to change how we do this, I don't know, but I would like to see us explore moving away from having that in-person in the random place visitor study and do more streetlight and do a, a survey of people not necessarily in the parks but just in the region on where are they going in terms of their park needs and, and what are we missing and we probably have a better idea of where we need to go in the future than using our dinosaur visitor study. <laughs> Councilmember Hallison about some about that exact same point. It's we're not talking to people who aren't using the parks. Yeah, uh, I'll uh, recognize Councilmember Johnson. We'll know we're about a minute away from our time, certain for a public hearing. And thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I just want to thank Joel and Emmett and and Hannah because I had. Um, the Three Rivers Park District to Commissioner reach out to me uh, when the news stories came out about this. And just for level setting briefly, we um, didn't have quorum at the July meeting when we were going to meet when this item was going to come before us. And the press got a hold of the one pager without the benefit of the presentation and it got out there. So there was some concern. I know in my district, um, 
from elected and appointed officials, perhaps, about the, the data privacy piece of it. And I just want to reiterate and I want to thank uh, the team here because I presented to them on Thursday last week that the Met Council is not looking for people's private data. We cannot get it and Streetlight doesn't have it. This is a tool we've used for transit, transportation planning. Other agencies through the state have done so. And I think that it's really important that this is a partnership with our local implementing agencies. Our park districts are experts in their local parks and we recognize that. And through our research teams, we can come alongside of their research staff and their um, teams that are gonna be implementing programs and trying to figure out how, how to best approach equity and get to all that data. I know that the question was asked, will this replace something? And I think, you know, our answer certainly in that meeting was, you know, this is to validate things right now. And they really um, have that local control. We're partners in that with them. So I really want to thank the Three Rivers Park Board. I'm going to be doing a follow up on some of the questions that they had. And I would like um, to at least send them this clip of this discussion so that they do have benefit of the full presentation. So thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Joel, for helping fill me in to explain how this works um, so that people don't have to be afraid that Met Council is doing something um, that would be very invasive. In fact, we're trying to not do that. And we really do hold highly our local elected officials um, to be on the ground doing that work. Thank you, Council Member. And Mr. Henning, we're at the uh, time certain for our public hearing, so if I could ask you to, to wrap up and we were just two slides from the end. There we go. I know. We're so close, so close. So thank you very much. Ray. This was a fascinating presentation. Thank you. So now we'll just move into the public hearing, correct? Okay, great. Is there a presentation from Ms. Gio or is she? No, thank you. Anyway, so, right, so thanks. So uh, welcome. As an administrator of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Housing Choice Voucher Program, the Council's Housing and Redevelopment Authority is required to prepare and submit an annual update to its public housing agency plan. The plan serves as a guide to the Metro HRA programs, policies, operations, and strategies for serving the needs of very low and extremely low income households. The plan is intended to be a convenient source of information for program participants, the federal government, and the general public. The, this plan is the subject of this hearing. We will now convene the public hearing to take comments on the proposed public housing agency five-year plan for 2020 to 2024, an annual plan for 2020. So welcome and thanks for attending this hearing. Anyone who wishes will be allowed to provide comments. To accommodate all individuals present, uh, we'll have a loose time limit of comments for individuals of three minutes and representatives of organizations for five minutes. If you wish to speak at this meeting but have not yet signed in, please sign in at the registration seat in the entrance room. Uh, we'll start with anyone who has pre-registered to speak and I'll call on people to speak in the order in which they signed in. When you speak, please state your name, place of residence, and the organization you represent, if any. Written statements in addition to oral comments are accepted. You may leave a printed copy of your remarks if you have one. And uh, staff will bring in the list. Is someone? Hey, Ms. Smith. Is Ms. Smith, thank you. I think somebody else wants to put their name on the Mr. list. Chair, we have one guest who is um, here from our resident advisory board that wishes not to speak, and there's someone checking in right now. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Keel. Great. Thank you, Ms. Smith. So the public. Okay. Thank you. So we did have someone that signed in who was a representative of a residence council. So, th so thanks for being here. And we do have someone who is in signed in and interested in speaking, and that's Ms. Sims. I invite you to come forward, please, and state your name and place of residence. And organizational affiliation, if you have one. Nice to see you, Ms. Sims. Um, I'm Michelle Sims. I'm an organizer advocate with MICA, Metropolitan and Faith Council on Affordable Housing. I'm a resident of uh, North Minneapolis, 50 years, et cetera, et cetera. And um, you all haven't seen me, but I normally come to Met Council meetings. But since you all have been in office, you haven't seen me. Um, 
I've seen you. <laughs> and I saw you, and I saw you plenty right. when I was in Minneapolis. Right. Um, and I guess um, one of the things that I encourage Met Council and you all to consider doing is having an opportunity for the community to come in um, and report back to you all. You all don't come, get to the community, especially the equity committee. So we have to need to come, the opportunity to come to you more than four or five minutes. Uh, you'll hear a lot. It's like the young man was giving information on Worth Park. I live three blocks from Worth Park. I know a lot of, I can answer a lot of the questions mm. that he brought up. Um, but in regards to the housing thing, one of the things that came to mind, and I didn't realize that this was on until I sat here, is that, um, in 2014, you, some of you may realize that MICA and our other organizations uh, did a um, complaint to HUD regarding the fair housing. Uh, it was two different uh, complaints. One was uh, uh, with the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. The other one was with um, state agencies, uh, including the state of Minnesota, Minnesota <coughs> Housing Finance. And the Met Council. All of the other organizations um, volunteered to agree to uh, do some sort of arrangements to uh, deal with the um, violations of the Fair Housing Act, all except the Met Council, the last that I heard, which was a few months ago. And my question at this point, I guess if the Met Council has decided to voluntary comply with the complaint? If not, why not? And how is this fair housing policy agent uh, plan meeting the needs that are out there? And um, I guess I have a lot of questions in that regard. If you haven't, all the agencies, and there were five or six different agencies, some at the state level, level uh, so, uh, um, uh, Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center, Richfield, a lot of the uh, neighborhood associations. So, uh, if you're not, still are not agreeing to comply with the voluntary step, how are you balancing it? Uh, where's the equity? Um, just how are you meeting the needs that are out there? And that's, that's what I would like to know in regards to rep, not only representing Micah, but also I, um, I'm on various organizations or committees with the Blue Line Extension, the CAC for the Blue Line Extension, the Environmental Justice of the Minnesota Pollution Control, uh, and several other things. So uh, they all are interrelate. And uh, so I, I'm just kind of, of uh, kind of has a quiz to why or how, if you're not complying, how are you uh, addressing the need? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sims. Thanks for being here. Thanks for your comments. Director Barajas, did you want to sure. respond? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would just note for council members and our guests today that because of the ongoing nature of the HUD complaint that we won't provide additional detail at this time. Um, there's a long ongoing process that's still kind of hanging out there. Um, and just in general that I would say the HUD complaint was largely about the council's comprehensive planning responsibilities in relationship to local governments. The public housing agency plan are, is related to our responsibilities as a housing and redevelopment authority and follows the strict requirements of the federal uh, housing and urban development um, uh, department um, in what we need to do in order to um, meet all of those pieces. Um, and our HRA components were not a portion of the complaint that was filed with HUD. Thank you. Councilmember Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would also note that when we have these official public hearings, we're taking comments and then they get responded to later. We don't normally do a back and forth at public hearings. Correct. Thank you. So the public hearing is still open. I have no one else signed up to speak. Is there anyone else that wanted to speak in the public hearing? Anyone else? 
So I'd say thank you for participating in the public hearing. Com public comments will be accepted through 4.30 p.m. on August 29th. To comment on the PHA plan, members of the public may write to the council uh, at 390 Robert Street North in St. Paul, Minnesota, 55101. You can email the council at public.info at metc.state.mn.us. You can record a comment on the public comment line at 651-602-1500 or TTY at 651-291-0904. At the close of the public comment process, our staff will prepare a summary of public comments. The council will have an opportunity to review those comments prior to the council action on the PHA plan. This hearing is now adjourned, and seeing no further business before the committee, we're adjourned. <laughs>